Hello and welcome again to the Hummingbird Hub. This is another exciting podcast with another special individual. Uh, my name is Julia Fetisova, as you know, and we've got Andreas Christodoulidis here, who is a general surgeon who participates in contributing his time and expertise as charity uh, to go out on a far out missions to help people with limited needs and operate uh, cost free, basically. So, Andreas, welcome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much for being here with us. Thank you for sharing your experience, your expertise. First and foremost, um, I would like to ask you, what has moved you to contribute so much of yourself somewhere so far, far out for free? Well, it started as a joke, basically. <laughs> The whole thing started as a joke. Okay. I was operating one day, I was complaining as usual that I wasn't given the right instruments. And I told the nurses that I may as well be operating in Sahara, I'll be getting better instruments there. Yeah. So um, then I thought about it and I thought maybe it's not a bad idea to go and see what's happening out there. And uh, the first mission was in Nepal, in a small hospital uh, up in the mountains run by a Christian organization. Um, um, it was a, a United Mission Hospital. It was established in 1954 by a group of missionaries. And um, I wrote them a letter, asked them if they would be accepting me for three weeks. And they were very happy to have me. So I flew to Kathmandu um, in uh, 2015. Um, got a plane to get to the um, closest uh, airport. And then after three hours drive, I managed to reach the hospital, which was a, a small hospital run by missionaries and local people. And I joined them and we operated with the local surgeons and a couple of um, uh, missionary surgeons there, one from Canada, one from Australia, uh, spent three weeks there. And then I asked them if they would have me the next year, which uh, they, were, they accepted me for another year. So I joined them the next year for two weeks. Um, after that, we joined a mission with the Mission to Heal um, organization from America and went to Mongolia, where we, tra we traveled two and a half thousand kilometers uh, on the train. We screened patients all over Mongolia, brought them back to the capital Ulaanbaatar and operated there for three days. And then the next mission was in the uh, Philippines, again with the Mission to Heal organization. We um, uh, traveled to um, Manila, and then we got a bus and a ferry and, and reached a small island of uh, a population of 300,000 people. Um, four doctors, not surgeons there. We were. Um, joined by the Medical Ambassadors of Philippines, which is a charity organization uh, in Philippines. Um, and we operated uh, for uh, uh, six days or so. The first day was interesting because we didn't have our truck, with a, um, which was being converted into a, an operating room. There was no operating room in the, in the uh, hospital. And unfortunately, the truck broke down on the way to this island, Marinjuk. Um, so we ended up operating on the mayor's office in the mayor's office for the first <laughs> night from 11 o'clock at night to 5.30 in the morning and we continued and then we took a couple of patients we couldn't operate uh, in the truck and took them to the base hospital in Manila uh, operated on them there um, and next year we're planning to go to um, 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 Cambodia uh, with the Medical Ministry International, which is uh, again another uh, surgical organization providing services around the world. And we'll be joining the Filipino group uh, who goes there every year. So it's, it's around 13th of August to the end of August, we'll be operating in Cambodia. So this is our uh, next project. So you really took that joke seriously? Huh? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you really it's manifested fun. It's it. Fun. It's fun. It's fun. We have another trip planned for uh, Philippines after Cambodia. 
and possibly back to Nepal or Uganda. So I would imagine like out of all these countries, you probably went to the one that is the most challenging first. <laughs> Nepal is an interesting country. It's a, it's a very interesting country. Uh, nobody wants to know about them. They're all poor. They're all smiling. Um, I was lucky because I spent the three weeks just before the big earthquake happened, uh, five years ago or so. Um, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. And uh, I, it's unbelievable conditions. I mean, you don't, people don't realize how lucky they are to be living in the Western world. Um, there is absolutely no infrastructure at all. And what and what is your general um, feedback on the people? Your general idea of the people? I mean, living in such poverty, not having not having any medical support. I mean, they accept life as it comes. Wow! And they live the day. I hope they're going to live the next day. But this is such a wake up call, right? Yeah. That that yeah. makes you also, I'm assuming, appreciate. What you oh, have absolutely. in your life, and I mean, absolutely. for us, like like you said, we take so many things for granted. Yeah. Whereas there's people that are literally fighting for their survival yeah. every yeah. day, and it's such a and it's such a honorable thing that you are doing that you know to to actually go yeah. out there and give them what they need at that oh, time. It's fun. It's fun. Fun. It's fun. <laughs> I would never yeah. have imagined yeah. no, that you would say it's fun. It's fun. It's fun. It's worth it. I'm sure that 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 is for sure. I think any kind of charitable, um, um, how you say it, any char charitable action is always worth it because it's, of the feeling that yeah. you get. It's incredible how how many, uh, how little they have and how they have to survive on these little resources they have. They haven't got the basics. They, they haven't got medication. They haven't got anything. I think in this little island we were, if you have a major trauma, a major road tra traffic accident, you're dead. By the time you reach Anywhere where they can provide you with any decent uh, medicine, I think you you you're gone. You know, it's almost like sad to know that things that things like that still happen in the world that is so fast developing. Yeah. That you would see, like in the Western world, we've got AI and we've got you know so many things that are contributing to us living, and you've got such poverty somewhere yeah. else. Really. It's it's incredible, absolutely incredible. But there's, like you said, there's so much to learn, right? What What is the most common, what are the most common operations that you had to perform in islands like that, places like that? I, I th we, in Nepal, we covered the whole spectrum of general surgery. I mean, it was interesting because they would be doing gynecology, they would be doing obstetrics, they would be doing um, um, uh, uh, urology. Uh, they had orthopedic surgeons, um, and um, which are very, very, very good. In fact, one of the orthopedic surgeons was actually covering general surgery be and because in general surgery you have to cover obstetrics and he was able to do cesareans. I've never seen an orthopedic surgeon <laughs> doing cesareans. So he was covering that aspect as well. Um, there was a lot of burns. They, uh, they wrap their uh, uh, blankets around them to avoid the cold and they have lot fires in the room they're living and suddenly the blanket catches a fire so we had major burns every day at least two or three major burns i think it's the third hospital in nepal with the most major burns um, and it was interesting because <laughs> the um, the um, the way they were dressing the burns was honey honey has antibacterial properties and uh, they had to uh, wrap them in uh, in honey, and then there would be uh, the flies will uh, go for the honey, and then they would get secondary infections, and it was very very messy. Uh, that was the uh, every day you get major burns in this hospital, um, but we were co we we coped limited surgical equipment, limited uh, resources. Um, you should just do your best and hope for the best. And how how are those missions funded? I the first couple of years I funded myself for the first two missions, and then we set up a um, a, a money box in the office, and people donated to us, and uh, we managed to fund uh, the last two missions. were funded uh, from various uh, uh, from money given to us by um, organizations or individuals. Um, in Mongolia, 
we were hosted by the railway um, uh, company of Mongolia. Uh, so we lived on the train for two and a half, two weeks, more or less. It was interesting because there was no hot shower. So um, uh, the majority of us got two showers in two weeks, which was not very good. And it's and really it, hot there too, And right? it was hot because we traveled. The first week we traveled to the border with um, Russia on the north. Then we came back to Lambatar, we did uh, some surgery there, and then we went through Gobi uh, Desert to the Chinese border, which was uh, basically we covered 2,500 kilometers um, on the train. Came back to uh, Ulaanbaatar after we collected the patients, brought them back with us, and um, we did surgery there. So it was three of us uh, in Mongolia. In Philippines, we had a group of uh, um, four of us. Um, plus the people who came with the uh, uh, medical ambassadors and the mission to heal. Um, we spent uh, more or less 10 days in, in this on this island. We screened patients for two days and then we started operating. Uh, at the same time, anybody who turned up uh, at, the, um, at the hospital where we parked the truck outside, um, we screened them there and we operated on them there. The problem is that we our anesthetic machine broke down, so we couldn't give any general anesthetic. We have two great anesthetists from Manila um, who are giving spinal anesthesia, so we did what we could under spinal anesthesia. And then the ones we couldn't do there, we took them to, uh, I think it was about three, uh, we took them to Manila and operated in the, um, in the charity hospital they, have, they run there. Uh, which is about 23 kilometers uh, out of the center of Manila. Oh my goodness. So, um, yeah. and Cambodia, I don't know what to expect. Uh, we, um, we, again, we're operating out in the country. I think when we one village near the Metcong uh, River, we're going there first and then somewhere south. So it should be interesting to see what, uh, what we're going to be faced uh, <laughs> there. Can't wait to hear about yeah. that. But it's really you, you have to have such good crisis management because if, if anesthesia runs out right how can you operate on anyone maybe? okay we try we try to we try we did 120 cases in, in philippines on the island under local anesthesia so we screened those patients before and we call, um, uh, got a group which could have been done under uh, local anesthesia then we uh, got another group which could have been done under spinal anesthesia and then the major cases we we had to um, see what we could do in Manila. The plan is to go back at some stage and get some of those patients and bring them back to Manila. Um, we're planning to go somewhere in the future back to Philippines because the university of, in America, the University of Utah has uh, devised this um, disposable laparoscopic cameras um, and they want us to try them uh, hopefully we'll try them in Manila in the hospital first to see if it's a, if we can actually do the surgery there and then if that's possible then we may go and do it out in the, uh, uh, in the on the islands or somewhere else I think what we decided to do was to operate on cases where Safety was obviously the first factor, if we could be safely do the surgery and if we could follow the patient, because there's no follow-up. Mm. When we leave, there's only one doctor and that doctor is very junior. We had to teach him how to uh, do local uh, cases under local anesthetic and uh, we didn't want to burden him with cases he couldn't cope with or he had to send away. So we uh, decided to do minor cases in, in these places. In Ulaanbaatar, we basically um, operated on cases the local surgeons wanted to um, uh, learn uh, from our expertise or experience, if you like. So they chose the cases and uh, we helped them to do it. I think it's not just um, dealing with the patients, it's also uh, helping the local people uh, to gain more confidence Sometimes we learn from them because uh, they are very, very ec good surgeons. The uh, uh, Mongolian surgeons were excellent surgeons. Technically, they were brilliant. And then the same with the Filipino surgeons. I work with a Filipino surgeon, which is exceptional in my opinion. Uh, they're just lacking the uh, uh, 
for, you know, the instruments and, uh, and the things we use in the Western world uh, due to lack of funding. Um, we tried to take instruments with us um, and I've managed to send back to Mongolia some laparoscopic instruments last year. Uh, we're trying to send some more laparoscopic instruments in Manila, in Philippines, um, this year. Uh, we try to take all we can with us and uh, leave them behind. Um, so basically, it's give and take. We we learn from them because they're they're very very good, uh, skillful surgeons. I mean, Nepalese surgeons were exceptional. I thought they have such a volume of work, um, but they just haven't got the correct instruments. This is incredible. Yeah, there are so many talented yeah. people that uh, just don't have the right means. Fantastic. They're really good surgeons. They have a great volume of, uh, of work. I mean. You stop operating when you cannot operate anymore. Basically, the cases are there. I mean, I've got the, uh, I've got in uh, in Nepal in Tansen. Uh, uh, we used to write the cases on the board, and every time you uh, uh, you finish one, you uh, wipe the name, and uh, and then two more would be added. So you, there was never it was mm. never ending story. Mm. You kept going. But so so I would imagine that you know. Uh, surgeon's work, surgeon's job is such a selfless job that you because you you really just like you said until you exhaust yourself yeah. you have to be and also I mean surgery so your your focus on something has to be so sharp you yeah. have to be because somebody's life is dependent on you. Well, you get used to that. You don't you don't think about really? that. A selfish a selfless job done by selfish people. <laughs> Interesting. How is that? Why is selfish? <laughs> because. Because I, I, th I think surgeons are selfish by nature, or, by, or, they, or they become selfish because all they care is they focus on one thing and they forget everything else. And you have to focus on what you're doing. So everything else is, takes second place. So you, you become selfish in, in, in a way. But it becomes, it's, it's a way of life. It's like an you occupational, know, it's like an occupational, how you say it, not hazard, yeah. but you, you actually, your profession shapes you. Yeah, then yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. What can anybody do to help you in your mission? Uh, yeah, there are various ways. I mean, uh, these organizations we go with, uh, you can donate to these organizations. You can help us with our funding uh, because obviously we have to uh, um, uh, provide uh, the organizations we go with um, with some uh, with money to uh, um, cover our accommodation and our travel expenses. Um, we're going to try to start sending instruments to these countries in the future. We had problems in Mongolia where we took uh, three bags of instruments and unfortunately one of the bags was uh, uh, stopped at the airport and they wanted to find us. We, we took a lot of antibiotics and um, uh, local anesthetics and Obviously, despite the fact that we had a letter from the ministry and and from the um, pharmacies here that they were European Union uh, um, uh, accepted medication, they decided to confiscate that uh, that uh, bag and and actually fine us a thousand dollars fine, which we didn't pay at the end. We settled for fifty dollars fine, <laughs> uh, but we lost our, our um, all our medication. There, so we found that it's a difficult process to get stuff through the airport because they either want taxes or, or, or they confiscate them. So we we're trying to find a way now how to uh, get them the uh, these instruments in the country. I am, and I'm going to try to get in touch with the ambassadors of those countries mm -hmm. in Cyprus and see if there's a way to get these things through their diplomatic uh, um, uh, their bags. Um, so basically, these these are the two ways: either uh, contribute to our funding for uh, travel expenses, uh, try to send instruments uh, to them, uh, or contribute to the organization which is um, uh, actually uh, uh, organizing these trips. Mm -hmm. um, so there is there is a lot of room for improvement. Oh yes, because it's yeah. such a you know it's a road less traveled. Yeah. And there is a lot of things that will come across, but once it, once it actually comes through and you 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 get the right way, I'm, I'm assuming it will be a lot easier. Yeah, it's uh, we're, we're trying to basically we try to establish. Uh, we, we it's much easier if you spend time in one country than just going from one to the other. 
because I think with, you travel with the same people every time, uh, see the uh, cooperate with the same people in the uh, in the hospital. So it's much easier to um, organize yourself because you know what they want, what they like to do. Uh, they know you, you know them, you establish this sort of trust relationship and you trust each other uh, at the medical level. Um, so we're going to try to uh, go f limit our countries in the, in the future and uh, possibly cover Philippines, maybe, maybe Cambodia, Uganda, and maybe back to Nepal again at some stage. The problem with Nepal is that they have, uh, we stopped going there. Uh, I have stopped going there. Uh, I used to go on my own, and they wanted a, um, a, a work permit. Uh, and, the, and the, rightly, they wanted that uh, because what happens is that there are a lot of people outside Nepal who go there, uh, operate, get paid, and leave. So they wanted to stop that. Um, so the, the requirement was that you have a work permit. The problem is that to get a work permit, you need two weeks. And two weeks uh, is probably going to take you much longer than that. And we couldn't afford to have all this, um, to spend four weeks in Kathmandu to get a work permit. So we're going to have to find another way to get there. And that probably we're going to try to do that through one of the organizations in the future. Um, in Cambodia and Philippines, they organize the, usually the mission to heal or the medical ambassadors organize that. Um, we. I don't need a, um, a, a license to operate there because under the, their law in Nepal or Philippines, you are uh, allowed to um, uh, operate as long as there is somebody from that country with, uh, who is registered with a medical council is present. And we always make sure that there's somebody there. Mm -hmm. So um, we go, that way we, we've cut a lot of uh, administration uh, uh, problems out and bureaucracy. Uh, um, so, but, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty tough because it's... Um, yeah. Mongolia were living on the train for two weeks and uh, <laughs> it, was, it was difficult. Uh, you know, two, two weeks to have two showers, it was so not very pleasant. So it's also in the conditions Gobi. for you that conditions you Conditions were not yeah. good. Okay, they, try, they tried to do their best. In, in, uh, in Philippines, we stayed in this little hotel, uh, supposedly hotel, in, uh, in the middle of this village, uh, which was run by the uh, mayor, uh, who was kind enough to look after us. And, uh, you know, there were so many people at one stage, uh, a couple of us had to, had to sleep on the floor with no air condition at night time. Uh, but uh, anyway, it, it was fun. <laughs> it should be interesting to see what we're going to be facing in Cambodia this year. Oh, okay. uh, because we're going in August and I think it's monsoon time. So th that should be interesting yeah. uh, to see. H how come uh, you haven't touched upon Africa yet? Yeah, we're gonna. Hopefully, we we'll get there. I, I, I always said that because I take a few people with me every time. I always place uh, safety as as the first um, uh, factor, and uh, I'm, I'm not sure how safe Africa is. Uh, it may be, it may not be. We haven't tried it yet, so uh, that's the main reason we haven't uh, we haven't uh, touched Africa yet. I mean, we we hope to organize a Uganda trip at some stage. Mm -hmm. um, it's difficult because you're working here and you have to, uh, more or less, you're away for three weeks. So it's difficult to start doing that every uh, every few. Uh, I can just about get one mission per year, maybe maybe a quick trip somewhere for a week or something in the future and another mission uh, uh, mm. will be able to... Um, to do that. Have you considered maybe collaborating with other surgeons that can cover other areas somehow so it's not all on you? Really, no, the problem with these places is that you haven't got the resources. So you can forget what we're doing here. We're going to do what we're faced there and with the resources we have there. So yes, uh, ideally we should be able to, we should be taking other, other specialties uh, and the problem is that like orthopedics, they haven't got orthopedic equipment there apart from a plaster. So it's, you know, they're not going to be able to do anything more than that. Mm -hmm. um, with gynecological surgery, we're trying to establish laparoscopic surgery now uh, for the gynecologists, for us. 
um, is, the, is the resources which is the limiting factor because you're operating in the middle of nowhere. So you cannot take what you're doing here and, and take it over there. You, so it's a little bit difficult. At some stage, we should be able to uh, take a few other specialties mm -hmm. uh, along with us. But at the, at the moment, it's just whatever comes. I mean, I've been informed that in Cambodia, uh, they will be doing gynecological surgery. I'm not a gynecologist. I mean, I, I can do it if I have to, but I, I will let people who, mm -hmm. who are doing it every day. Mm -hmm. uh, the same with Mongolia. The surgeon I worked in Mongolia was doing general surgery and gynecological surgery. So. So it's a different world. My goodness, out there. It, it really is. It really is. And what is the the feedback from people that have been treated by you? A big smile. I'm sure. <laughs> a big smile. I have a wonderful photograph somewhere. Uh, a guy did a, a hernia in the morning under spinal anesthesia, and uh, at five o'clock I saw somebody waving at me uh, on a motorbike. So uh, leaving the hospital, and I say, "Who is this guy?" And they told me that it was the guy who operated in the morning. He got on his motorbike and, <laughs> and left in the afternoon. You're not going to see that happening in Cyprus, I can assure you of that. That's for sure. So there isn't actually even even for them to stay overnight longer to actually like only have the recovery? One, one, only the big cases. Wow. Everybody else goes home in the in the afternoon. We, we do really the, are so blessed. Yeah, you know that. yeah, yeah. absolutely. So that because Absolutely. we have that we have that aftercare, it's like it's exactly what you were saying. I mean, what I think is also lacking there is the education. It's the education part of actually the aftercare. The you know because you can't be there for so long. For so, sure, yeah. that's why I want to uh, stay in one country, in one you know one or two regions, because then you get to know the people there, the the, the medical people there, and then they know what you're doing. You you interact with them, you support them, you teach them, and uh, and it's not just treating people, it's also um, uh, passing expertise to the, to the other people there. Because mm -hmm. these people are lacking communication with medical people outside the country. I mean, they, so they uh, don't get to learn. They get, don't, don't get to learn, or they, uh, and, and it's nice to be able to hear something new, and, and it's useful for us. I mean, I'm learning from them as well, so uh, there you go. Like it's like an exchange yeah, program. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's it also like it, it would be great to see at some point maybe having some congresses or conferences where they get to travel and meet somewhere and have that education. Uh, it's the money out. problem. You see, it's not easy for them to travel to, uh, sure. to get the money. I mean, the other thing we thought in the future to do is that we'll to actually start educating people on screening, like, um, you know, mammography and pap test and uh, prost prostate uh, cancer and things like this. So we thought in the future that we'll get, a, we could prepare a series of lectures for the uh, uh, lay person mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and spend one evening and uh, give them a couple of lectures and invite anybody from, uh, from there. Uh, women don't know much about uh, pap test, they don't know much about mammography, uh, so... Uh, uh, Is there a way to maybe organize online support, but I'm assuming maybe they don't have internet there? No, they, ha they probably have internet, but it's it's much easier if you if you gather them when in one of these missions and actually start talking to them about that mm -hmm. and, and make them aware. They may not be able to afford to or find a place to go and have these tests, but at least they're aware that they exist. And maybe they will start searching to see where they can have them done. So uh, that's that's the next uh, uh, plan, Step. to actually not just uh, do the medical thing, but to actually start educating people uh, uh, on that level. Mm -hmm. Well, then, as you said before, it's the funding that really needs to kick off and onto the next level yeah. in order to be to be able to provide that. We haven't done too badly, I have to say. In the last three years, we, we got uh, enough funding, and people are kind enough to uh, actually sponsor us and uh, and take. Uh, you know, I, I we took a theatre operating room nurse last year who was very useful. We took a secretary with us last year who actually we trained her there and she was uh, helping us in the operating room. Um, so, you know, anybody uh, can help basically. And uh, yeah, this is, uh, with their time and yeah. with their funding. Yeah. What, what would, um, 
uh, how, how to say, what would be the next step in order to gain more funding so that all the visions that you've expressed here can have the support? I think we have to sit down. I think we have to sit down with uh, somebody to guide us. I, I don't know how we can start uh, continue this fundraising. Uh, it's, it's difficult to ask the same people every year to uh, actually give you money. So maybe we should do a foundation or organize some uh, organization. Uh, I'm not an expert on that. I have to go and, uh, and seek some expertise from somebody to uh, help us to, how to do that. Well, this is exactly what this yeah. space is here for, uh, to kind of reach out to our audience who is interested in having to participate mm -hmm. in this or give us the knowledge how this can be taken on to the next level because missions like these are the missions that improve the world, you know, one mission at a time. And it's because of people like Andreas that we have hope for humanity so uh please uh, who whoever is um willing to co contribute and help us in this mission um leave your comments below uh, we will have the link to the charity organization that andreas is running and uh, hopefully organize future events with this um uh, thinking in mind in order to be able to support um these missions and many more to come so this is the main really the main um uh, reason why we're gathering here is just to bring more awareness to missions like yours to this world. Yeah. So, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very Julia. much. Oh, thank you. Thank it's you for inviting me. Such a pleasure. Yeah. And you're sharing your experiences. Yeah. I'm sure there's lots more to come after you've yeah. been to Cambodia. Yeah, we'll uh, have another <laughs> one after Cambodia. I'm sure of that. Yeah. I'm sure of that. And there's, uh, as you brought, lots of pictures and uh, so a very beautiful video, a very touching video, but you, with the, you actually see from the side and you observe the surgeons doing their work with all those, you know, little children and people who are really in need, getting the need, the, the help that they need is really a miracle um, to see and very touching. So all done to you. Thank you, know, you Julia. So thank you. Thank you again for being here and uh, stay tuned for more to come. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.